Welcome to the 20th Century History Series. All podcasts are released under a Creative Commons license and are free for non-commercial use. Each podcast is self-contained and does not require listening to previous episodes. The author is Kim Sonderborg, editor is Philip Bird, and the editor-in-chief is Dr. Liam Brown. All episodes are read by Kim Sonderborg. The Longest War, the Cold War For many of today's adults, the Cold War formed a smaller or greater part of their lives as children and teenagers. The war went on from 1946 to 1991 and thus lasted for 45 years. During these 45 years, most of the world's countries were forced to choose sides as the two superpowers, the democratic, capitalist United States of America and the Communist Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, formerly known as Russia, competed for world dominance. How could this be? How could a war last this long and come to involve wars in Europe, Asia, Africa and Latin America? And how could it suddenly end within a couple of years of disintegration of one of the two superpowers? These are some of the questions which we will try to explore in this episode. We will look at three basic perspectives. The first, how did the Cold War begin? The main factors in the beginning of the Cold War was the emergence of the two superpowers after World War II, the power vacuum created in Europe after World War II, and the creation of the first nuclear bombs, first detonated in Japan on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945. The second perspective will be, what kept the Cold War going? We will investigate how the structures of mutual distrust and the notion of having incompatible political, economic and ideological systems prevented openings in relations between the superpowers. The second perspective will be what kept the Cold War going. We will investigate how the structures of mutual distrust and the notion of having incompatible political, economic and ideological systems prevented openings in relations between the superpowers. This closedness was further fueled by the increasing arsenal of nuclear weapons on both sides, which created a situation in which a small mistake could potentially lead to the destruction of countries, continents or even the entire Earth. Various wars around the world were fought as proxy wars, with one side supported by the USA, the West, and the other by the USSR, the East. In Korea, Vietnam, and Latin America, other countries fought the conventional wars in which the USA and the USSR did not dare to face each other for the fear of a nuclear holocaust. Finally, the third perspective will focus on how the Cold War actually ended and which political, economic or social factors might have contributed to the end of the Cold War. As the decades had passed, Western capitalism had proven more successful than communist planned economy. As the USSR struggled to keep up in the nuclear arms race, several of its satellite states sensed the possibility of pulling away from the dominance of the Soviet Empire. Poland, Hungary and Czechoslovakia all nudged themselves closer towards independence until East Germany saw the destruction of the Berlin Wall and thousands fled into West Germany. The question is whether the end of the Cold War was driven mainly by economic or political or ideological forces. So, how did the Cold War begin and which factors drove the superpowers towards conflict? There are two main causes. First, the very existence of two competing superpowers. And second, a political and economic power vacuum in the center of Europe. After the fall of Nazi Germany in 1945, it became crucial for both superpowers to establish themselves firmly on European territory. At the end of World War II, it was clear that the USA and the USSR had grown stronger than any other powers. The USA had the strongest air force in the world and was economically able to produce more than all the other powers put together. The USSR, on the other hand, had the strongest land army in the world. At its highest, the Red Army consisted of about 10 to 12 million soldiers. 
Economically, the USSR was far from the level of the USA, but there was a potential for industrial development and quite a few raw materials were available. Where the USA promoted democracy, capitalism and free trade, the USSR had, since 1917, established itself as the world's first communist state. Both democracy and capitalism on the one side, and communism on the other, consider themselves universal systems and try to promote their respective ways of life to other countries. Most capitalist countries considered themselves, as always, allies and partners with the USA. During the final year of World War II, the USSR had created a string of satellite states along its border as the Red Army would simply stay in countries liberated from the Nazis and gradually installed Soviet-friendly governments there. Already in 1946, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave his Fulton speech, in which he declared that an iron curtain has descended across Europe. It was clear that the two systems were incompatible. By 1948, the Soviets controlled Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Albania and Bulgaria. In March 1947, American President Truman announced a new American policy of containment, also known as the Truman Doctrine. Containment means that the USA would support any country which felt threatened by outside or inside forces. The meaning was communist forces. In June 1947, the USA instigated the Marshall Plan, opening up a pool of 13 billion US dollars to European countries in need of restructuring their economy. The meaning was clear. The countries would have to have democratic governments and open economies. The USSR condemned this as dollar imperialism, while the West condemned the more or less hostile Soviet takeover of control in what was now known as Eastern Europe. But the main prize was Germany. By May 1945, Germany had been destroyed and a strong political and economic power center had gone. Both superpowers realized that Germany was the key to Europe. The country was divided into four occupation zones, where the three western ones, the British, French and American, in 1947 merged to become West Germany in 1949. The USSR kept its zone, creating East Germany. The former capital of Berlin had likewise been divided, and now consisted of a western and an eastern part, from 1961 separated by the Berlin Wall. Europe was firmly divided in two. As we see, the Cold War began as the result of two mutually incompatible political and economic systems which both struggled for domination. While the USSR used military force and coercion in establishing their satellite states, the USA offered protection and money to those states which would become, or stay, democratic. A third factor should be included, although it is difficult to say whether this was a cause or merely a contributing factor to the beginning of the war. In August 1945, the USA dropped the first nuclear bombs on the Japanese cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin was not informed about the nature of the bombs until afterwards and was shocked to realize that the West at this time had a weapon so strong that there was no comparison. And comparison, or as it was called, parity, was exactly one of the factors which kept the Cold War going for the next four decades. So, what all in all kept the Cold War going for so long? The two main factors would be the incompatibility of the two ideologies and how this incompatibility was hardened by the fact that both sides developed nuclear weapons strong enough to completely destroy the enemy and the rest of the world. These two factors combined created much of the coldness of the Cold War. There could be no mistakes in strategy and diplomacy for risk of a nuclear war and there could be no opening up for discussions with the enemy as this was seen as a possible failure of one's own political ideology and system. The closeness can be illustrated by the harsh crackdowns done by the USSR every time one of its European satellite states tried to rebel against the communist system. In East Germany in 1953, Poland and Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. 
Each time, the Soviets would use the force of the Red Army, permanently stationed in the satellite states for their own protection. In 1968, Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev even formulated the Brezhnev Doctrine, that an attack on socialism in one country should be viewed as an attack on socialism in the entire communist bloc, and that all members should send troops to fight it. The West could not intervene for fear of a nuclear war, and protests from the United Nations were ignored as the USSR refrained from taking part in any UN meetings for most of the Cold War. But also the West, led by the USA, would use military force in protecting a capitalist way of life. When China became communist in 1949 and communist North Korea invaded the capitalist South Korea in 1950, the Western bloc feared a domino effect of communism in Asia, that all the Asian countries would eventually fall to this enemy system. This was the main reason for the USA and its partners' long involvement in the Vietnam War from 1955 to 1975. The USA left Vietnam in 1973, but the war kept going. The USA and its allies could not accept the spread of communism, even when it meant fighting a war which was impossible to win. The nuclear arms race contributed to keeping the Cold War going as neither superpower dared step down from producing nuclear weapons. From 1960 to 1979, the USA went from having 295 intercontinental ballistic missiles to having 1,054. And the USSR went from 75 to 1,400. In 1945, the USA had six nuclear warheads, while in 1985 the number had risen to 23,000. The USSR went from zero to 39,000 warheads in the same period. It became a matter of keeping a power balance. The principle of mutually assured destruction, or MAD, made sure that both superpowers would not launch nuclear weapons because if one power did so, the other power would immediately retaliate and both powers would be destroyed. The tension of the nuclear threat reached its highest in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. At this time, President Kennedy employed the former President Eisenhower's policies of massive retaliation that the USA would meet any kind of Soviet attack with a nuclear response. He also used brinkmanship, meaning that the USA would go to the brink in case of a threat and not back down from using nuclear weapons if the enemy stared them in the face. During 13 days in October 1962, the whole world held its breath hoping that the USSR would not let a group of ships sail nuclear weapons to the Caribbean island of Cuba. Placing nuclear weapons on Cuba severely disturbed the power balance and the USA was willing to risk an all-out nuclear war in order to restore this power balance. Luckily, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev halted the shipment. In return, President Kennedy removed American nuclear weapons in Turkey. These had been equally threatening to the power balance being very close to the USSR. The Cold War was also kept going by the fact that there was little or no contact between the two sides in the war. Diplomacy was almost non-existent and both sides guarded their technological and political secrets from each other. The only way of obtaining knowledge was through espionage. The Soviet KGB and the American CIA became the front soldiers in the spy war, but all countries had an intelligence network. The two sides recruited agents from each other. In 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, an American couple, were executed for passing on American nuclear secrets to the USSR. In Britain, the KGB managed to recruit people such as Guy Burgess and Anthony Blunt straight out of Cambridge University. This group, the Cambridge Five, reached high up in the British establishment while passing on secrets to the Soviet Union. More ambitious projects, such as American U-2 spy planes and early satellite photography, increased surveillance of the enemy. Berlin was always a center for espionage, because here the two enemies were closest to each other. In 1955-56, CIA and British SIS constructed a 450-meter-long tunnel under the border to East Berlin in order to tap the phone connections.
500,000 conversations were recorded on 50,000 tapes, and the project was named Operation Gold. Unfortunately, the KGB had known all along. Right from the start, the secret had been passed on to the KGB by British spy George Blake, but the KGB chose to sacrifice the communication for instead keeping Blake deeply inside the British intelligence network. All in all, espionage contributed to prolonging the Cold War as it made the divide between the two sides deeper and prevented any real communication from taking place. As we can see, the incompatibility of the two opposing ideologies, democratic capitalism and communism, worked to keep the Cold War going for decades. This incompatibility was made stronger through the threat of world destruction in a nuclear war. Diplomacy was almost non-existing. The world became divided in two blocks, with little or no contact between its peoples. Often the only contact was through espionage, especially in Berlin. The two superpowers would take part in proxy wars in third countries, supporting, for example, soldiers on both sides of the Korean War and the Vietnam War, trying to promote their own political and economic ways of life. Large parts of the economy would go to military spending and development of nuclear weapons, turning the Cold War into a war between competing economic systems along with the political divide. How did the Cold War finally end? The three main factors contributing to the end of the Cold War would be detente in the 1970s, the failing economy of the USSR, and the rise of national opposition movements in some of the satellite states. Détente means a relaxation of tension. It began in the late 1960s. The early 1960s had seen rising danger of confrontation when the Berlin Wall was erected in 1961 and during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. By the end of the decade, the USA and the USSR were ready to begin steps towards lowering the risk of nuclear confrontation. Newly elected US President Nixon and his advisor Henry Kissinger wanted to withdraw American soldiers from Vietnam and the USSR invasion of Czechoslovakia and Brezhnev Doctrine in 1968 demonstrated the Soviets' inability to control their own satellite states. At the same time, new West German Chancellor Willy Brandt began opening up more relations towards East Germany through the so-called Ostpolitik. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, or SALT, of 1972 and 1979 limited the amounts of anti-ballistic missiles, that was SALT-1, and intercontinental and submarine launch missiles, ICBMs and SLBMs, along with heavy bomber planes. SALT was a limited success, but the high point of detente was the Helsinki Agreement of 1975. The agreement settled the borders of East and West Germany, promoted economic, scientific and cultural cooperation, and opened up for human rights receiving a stronger focus within the Soviet sphere. The Ostpolitik did similar things for the two Germanys. The USSR was ready for opening up relations as the economy was stagnating, and the Soviets were eager to explore Western technology. The West hoped that increased focus on human rights, basically in exchange for economic measures, would lead to a relaxation of communist control. However, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 put an end to detente and a new Cold War arose. In 1983, President Reagan announced the American Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, also known as Star Wars. A ring of satellites would orbit the Earth, shooting down any missiles from space using laser technology. The USSR had no way of matching this. In 1985, new Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev announced the policies of perestroika, restructuring and glasnost, openness. But the ideas came too late to revive the Soviet economy and society. Nationalist movements in some of the satellite states began proving too difficult to control, and especially the Solidarity Movement of Poland had so much popular support that when elections were made free in Poland in 1989, took control of the country. For the first time, an East European government was no longer controlled by the communists. 1989 became the year when the whole system crumbled. 
In Hungary, the fence between Hungary and Austria was dismantled by the Hungarian government and East Germans who were on holiday in Hungary and Czechoslovakia simply walked into Austria. In November, citizens of East Berlin walked up to the Berlin Wall and forced the guards to let them through into West Berlin. They then began tearing down the wall. The Czechoslovakian government carried through a velvet revolution dismantling the communist government without bloodshed. And Romania, Bulgaria and the Baltic states declared themselves independent. The massive Soviet Union, with a monolithic state apparatus, crumbled faster than anyone could have imagined. In 1991, the USSR itself disintegrated as its former republics renounced communist control. As we can see, the end of the Cold War came through three main factors. The policies of détente limited the production of nuclear weapons and opened up for cooperation between the two superpowers. The Soviet economy proved too inefficient to keep up a renewed arms race. And nationalist movements among the citizens of the Soviet Empire finally had enough. The end came very fast. In conclusion, the Cold War can be said to have been a war of its very own kind. It lasted from 1946 to 1991, spanning four decades. The two opposing systems of democratic capitalism and communism saw themselves as incompatible. Nuclear weapons and the fear of total destruction prolonged the war as the two competing superpowers did not dare provoking each other. And finally, the end of the Cold War came from a mix of factors, mainly stemming from the fact that the Soviet economy was stagnating, which resulted in a loss of control over the satellite states in the Soviet system. Gorbachev's reforms came too late, and in 1989 the whole Soviet system fell apart, as its citizens had finally had enough. The Cold War and the era of the superpowers had ended. This concludes this episode of the 20th Century History Series podcast. Music for the intro and outro was made by Andrea LaRose, while the music in this episode was made by B.O.K. To download more of these podcasts or to leave a comment, please visit www.historypodcast.net. Thank you for listening.